So that was a great segue because I'm going to wrap up the day with a couple of homages to Steve-isms. Um, I, I thought, given the end of the day, I'll try to make it relatively quick, but I wanted to kind of think about the general impacts of Steve on my life and everybody else's life. And one of my favorite Steve-isms is this title that I'll get to in a second. But I think that at least a generation of us would not disagree with the, the observation that Steve is someone who leads by example rather than by sort of direct instruction. And so everything I'm going to tell you is something that's absorbed uh, indirectly. So that means that each of us have taken different things from, from our interactions with Steve. Um, for me and, and some of my cohort, I know that we learned that one of the most important things as mentors was not to really um, bother your students with minutia like whether you're in the country or whether you might be coming into the lab on Wednesday or you know, did you, you maybe you got a grant funded or maybe that paper got accepted. These are things that really kind of get in the way of the, the graduate student experience and they're not all that interested in your life anyway. So um, to the chagrin of many of our own mentees, trainees, I think some of us have, have taken that to a greater or lesser degree into our own lives. Um, but again, all of these things are things that Steve really isn't known for his direct tell you what to do or what not to do, but rather to lead by example. And, and actually, I think that's worked out very well for most of us. One of the most important things to me that I learned from Steve was this, this was probably the one direct thing that he told me. It's like, do what you want to do. So by that, I, I'm talking about the activity. And the point of it was, um, if you want to be a snake catcher, be a snake catcher, make that your research. You want to pipette at the bench, there's a place for you. You want to code and do simulation, that's the thing you should do and that would make you happy. And I got this because in that period of life, that dark stage where you're freaking out, you can't figure out what your dissertation is, I was there, like I didn't know what to do. There are all these brilliant people around me at Chicago and I'm just like, yeah. And he's like, hey guy, let's get some ice cream. And we go down to Maury's, the cafeteria, and we get some ice cream. And he's like, well, so what do you want to do? I'm like, what do you, well, I want to get a PhD. I want to do a project. I don't know what I want to do. He's like, no, what do you want to do? You like to camp? You like to, you like to go catch snakes? You like to see things eat other things? I'm like, yeah, but I need a PhD. And he kind of helps me work through this way that we're going to turn that into a PhD and a project on looking at natural selection and color pattern and behavior. But it was really that bit about what do you want to do? And I still use that with my students. And they're always like, what do you mean? What do you want to do? Like, oh, let's go get some ice cream. <laughs> and it, it works. I mean, it's really brilliant. Um, one of the best parts of that is later on um, in one of my many uh, unfunded grant reviews, um, the best review I ever got was the comment that Brody seems to be little more than an overpaid snake collector. And I thought, I'll take it. That's great. I am successful. And I have Steve to thank for it. So this is my favorite Steveism of all. And I didn't realize that this had been absorbed into my own vernacular until I was talking to a student of mine, Robin Costello, about a week ago. I said, where are you going? What are you doing? Tell her, well, what are you going to talk about? I was like, I don't really know, but I think this is the title. She says, oh, you say that all the time. Like, oh, you know, this is like you grow up and you're your, your parents' kid and like, oh, I do? Really? I have that tick? Um, I actually think it's a really important lesson because um, what it told me, you know, he would always say, oh, if we don't know what, you don't know what you're doing. If we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. It was sort of the, the explanation for your screw ups or for not getting it right. And it kind of embodies this ethos of you don't have to know what the answer is going to be. And if you did know what the answer was, why were you really bothering to do it anyway, right? And so this is big and small. So he was totally supportive of me doing this crazy dissertation project. I never really could figure out if it was supportive or he just didn't really pay attention and caution me the way maybe he should have. It's like I'm off on this tangent about correlations between behavior and color pattern and and Russ told me why it was interesting. And so, you know, being around these people really helped. 
but I didn't realize I was out on a limb until I was in, I was uh, out at Pyramid Lake with Al Bennett, and we're sitting in a hot spring. And he's like, oh, so what are you doing for your dissertation? I'm like, oh, and I tell him, and I'm all nervous, which is awkward in a hot spring in the <laughs> desert. And he just kind of looks at me, he's like, that's crazy, that's not gonna work. And I'm like, oh God. <laughs> Steve had never warned me this wasn't gonna work, because that's okay. If, it, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. Um, I was gonna tell another story, maybe I'll do it later, but it, this goes to the big and the small. You know, you, we often don't know what we're doing. A number of people have made this point. This one is really dear to my heart. A lot of us came into Steve's orbit because we were into herps, and you've heard that from other people. And really, if you go back to the, these old pictures of Steve with a snake, or you go in the field with Steve, you know that natural history is driving what he's doing. And it's really important because a lot of the best science comes from, from the observations and then figuring out why that's an interesting problem. His classic thing on, on slugs and leeches and started with this diet variation study and he found that over on the coast they eat slugs and on, in inland populations they don't eat slugs. Turns out there really aren't slugs in, in the inland populations, but it's not that simple. There are these genetic uh, predispositions to feeding on different, or responding to different prey, prefer, uh, prey chemical extracts. So he uh, discovered this correlation between the preference to slugs and the preference to leeches. This became a, a paradigm in behavior genetics that's in all kinds of textbooks. But then he was able to explain this difference because of correlated selection. So he's taken this thing that's just basically barfing snakes. I mean, literally, squeeze them like a tube, out comes dinner. And he can figure out that, oh, we have this difference. There's probably selection against eating leeches because they crawl up out of your stomach and you have to swallow them over and over again. It's energetically costly. So if you're gonna respond to leeches and slugs, maybe over here where there are leeches, you're not gonna eat slugs. So it was this natural history observation that kind of carried it through. And I think that this is this incredible incredibly important aspect of being willing to let the organism tell you what's cool, but then be able to take that thing and translate it into great big picture evolutionary biology. And if anything came from the time with Steve, I think a lot of us who came in as herp nuts realized, wow, what we do can really affect other people and teach other people big questions. And that's, that's a huge lesson. Um, as a non-mathematician, uh, you've heard this from a couple of folks, we learned not to fear the math. Um, we came in as organismal biologists wanting to catch snakes, at least I did. Um, I had no idea what, an, like I had this thing that I joke about with my students now is like the equal sign as narcosis and it's just like, and I, somebody mentioned the, the law claw class, we called it super friends. Um, Charles Worth, Landy Arnold and Wade, and I remember as a first year student being in this class, just like this fog, west coast fog rolling past me of population genetics equations. And, and finally Steve comes up and he starts talking about snakes. I'm like, oh, God, I'm in. And then he throws up this formula and says, who recognizes this? And somebody next to me, I think it was Michael Foote, says, uh, oh, that's a covariance. And I'm like, oh, crap. Like, I, you know. And I got drug along with the wave and, and eventually I started doing models with covariances. A lot of it's not original to Steve, some is original to Steve, but the ability to take something like uh, a Wrightian path analysis and translate it into the, the morphometrics and, and functional biology of an egg-eating snake, now you're talking to different communities and that's, that's a huge uh, advance in science, you, the ability to translate. Right, and so that's this piece. And this is, uh, the quote's one of my favorite quotes from Charlie Mingus. Making the simple complicated is commonplace. Uh, we all know that, right? But making the complicated simple, awesomely simple, that's creativity. And to me, this is the embodiment of Steve. So when I talk to my students about, well, you know, what's, why is Steve so special? He's the guy that can translate these incredibly complicated multi-dimensional, multivariate equations, canonical axes and landscapes into metaphors, you've heard that too, 
and visuals that let everybody access that. And one of the pieces of that is we don't have to always get every piece of it to get the message. Sometimes getting part of that message can really advance what you do. And, and I think he's one of the great translators and scientific communicators that, that we've had. Um, on no less important but a simpler scale, um, it's never too early to wonder what's for breakfast. One of my fondest memories and, and uh, realizations of snake camp was you can sit around the fire after dinner and that's the time when you start wondering if you got stuff to make pancakes. You know, yeah, maybe we got bacon. You think we got bacon? Let's go see if we got bacon for breakfast. Right? Always look for the bright spot that's just around the corner. And that's Steve. And then, of course, and this is a good way to end this, let's, let's go get some ice cream. <laughs> so that's it. Um, he's, he's been an incredible mentor to those of us who he was an official trainer for, and obviously all those um, that have been in his orbit. And uh, we're all infinitely grateful. So thanks, Steve.